Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's Ask the Experts webinar on mental health in the LGBTQIA community. My name is Ben Caldwell. I'm the Education Director here at Simple Practice Learning. Uh, but none of you are here for me. You're here for our fantastic panel. We'll start with Justin Smith. Justin is in Houston, Texas, an LPC uh, teaching as well as working in private practice. Justin, you want to talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, so I am in Houston, Texas, been a therapist for eight years, uh, work in all sorts of settings, originally from Ohio, but had to escape the snow. Um, so I, I loving the heat down here in Texas. Um, and then it's just been a developing specialty of mine, being my identity as a gay black man, um, kind of merging the two with my clinical work, um, with my identity and my passion. So now not only doing full time work at a university, but also in my private practice, uh, where the bulk of my clients are gay men. Great, thank you very much, Justin. And I will tell you, loving the heat in Houston is not something I hear that often. It's good to have well, you with man, us today. I love it from the indoors. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> I like to see it outside, you know. <laughs> Our next panelist is Casey Tanner. Uh, Casey's a certified sex therapist. Um, and you're practicing in Chicago. Uh, Casey, you want to talk a little bit more about you and your work? Sure, absolutely. So my specialty is in the intersection of gender expansiveness and sexual expansiveness. I run a group private practice called The Expansive Group, and I also do a lot of free sex education via my Instagram, Queer Sex Therapy. Um, as Ben mentioned, I am an ASEC certified sex therapist, so I do work with a number of queer relationships and couples that want to expand what it looks like to have pleasurable sexual experiences. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's great to have you with us. And then Mo Brown. Uh, Mo Brown is licensed MFT in Illinois and Georgia. And Mo has a new course for us on Simple Practice Learning on uh, writing clinical referral letters for gender affirming medical care. Mo, you want to talk a little bit more about you and your work? Yeah, totally. I'm actually originally from Chicago, so I'm excited to, to hear anything about Chicago. Shout out to Casey. Um, I am currently living in Georgia. I run a private practice called Transcendent Therapy. And my goal at Transcendent is to serve as many transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary individuals as possible. Uh, I write a lot of referrals for surgeries, medical referrals, um, and I run some gender groups. I've done a good bit of cons consulting work uh, in organizations that want me to do safe space training or any kind of like gender affirming training. Uh, and I work a lot with people in relationships with people who are transitioning. And so uh, I say the spectrum of my practice is broad, but I do work a lot with gender identity. So uh, I'm just excited to be here today. Well, we're really grateful to have each of you here with us. I know you have a tremendous amount of expertise. It's going to be a pretty packed uh, hour. And we've got a bunch of, I think, very good questions from uh, clinicians asking about how they can improve their, their knowledge and their ability to be affirmative throughout their practice. So uh, let's just dive right in. Our first question comes from Marianne, who's asking, how can we as clinicians be mindful in the intake process, making sure we are providing affirmation? Casey, why don't we start with you on this one, and then Mo, I'll come to you, and then Justin. Awesome. Yeah, I love this question because I find that folks in the LGBTQIA community are often encountering their healthcare providers starting at a place of mistrust and looking for signs that they can begin to trust the person that they're working with. So intake is that first opportunity to show them right from the get-go that you are an affirming clinician. So one of the places that clients encounter first are your forms. And they'll encounter either a form that holds space for the different identities that they have, or they'll encounter a, a form that doesn't include the identities that they have. So one really simple suggestion I have for your forms is instead of presenting a form with different check boxes that people can choose for their identities, having forms that have open-ended questions so that people can choose to describe their sexual orientation and their gender identity any way that they want. Um, I think that's a really clear way to say, hey, we're here for you, however you describe yourself, whatever language works for you. 
I think uh, a mistake that people make in the intake process is that they as therapists will have done the training to be really affirming, but perhaps folks on their intake team haven't had the opportunity to get that same training. And so being aware that folks on your intake team are gonna be interacting with people's pronouns, people's names, wanting everyone to know the importance of using affirming pronouns and of not just getting people's legal names for the forms you have to fill out for insurance, but also getting the names that people use on a daily basis that are the most affirming for them. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and it's kind of a nice transition. I know that Mo, in your course, um, you talk about in the in the letter writing process and especially how that applies with insurance, that it, you have to kind of balance what's required on a form or required for an insurance record uh, with making sure that you are using um, the affirmative language and, and the, the client's name. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how it applies in the intake? Absolutely. So uh, on your forms, if you are collecting someone's uh, legal name, uh, I like to also collect whatever name it is that they want to be called and make sure I only call my clients by the name they want to be called. And I give a little bit of a caveat. You'll, I'll say something like, you'll only see me use your legal name if I'm sending a form to insurance. Uh, and that's so intentional, but it's very, very important uh, to the work. Uh, I also like to start first sessions, first intake sessions uh, from the very beginning with that kind of question. What would you like to be called? And I like to offer my pronouns. I broke my first rule here today. I didn't start with, hey, I'm Mo Brown. My pronouns are they, them, or he, him. Uh, so I'm doing it now. <laughs> and I see everybody else is like, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, so totally, that's exactly, that's so right, Ben. I would start from the very beginning with those kinds of mentionings of this is what I have to share with insurance. This is uh, this is what my policy is here. I'm open to calling you whatever you like to be called and I'll use whatever pronouns you want to be called and for insurance purposes and only for insurance purposes. So if you have a private pay client, you get to collect whatever gender identity, uh, sex they identify as, and it's not as important. Um, uh, but for insurance purposes, legal sex and legal name are what the insurance wants to see. Yeah. Um Justin, I'm, I'm curious if there are other elements of the intake process that you'd like to speak to here. And I, I guess one that I'm curious about, um, you don't need to take it in this direction if you've got something else in mind, but one that I'm curious about is the waiting room. Uh, in some of the earliest uh, training that I got on, on you know, affirmative, um, affirmative care, affirmative communications, uh, there was a lot of discussion about making sure that your waiting room is is welcoming and that there are clear indicators there. But now that we're all telehealth, um, how do you how, how do you show from the very beginning of the intake process that uh, clients are in a safe and affirming environment? I do miss the waiting room. So, uh, you know, I like the what that looks like. So I remember like having different magazines and different like posters and things like that. Um, things to be mindful of. Um, and then to go on around that same vein, I mean, you can do it now virtually though. So on your website is your kind of waiting room now because that's their, their first introduction to you. Um, I always say like, we will, a, a pride flag can be like two inches on your website. I'll find it, <laughs> someone else will see it. Um, so even just those images of the, the flags that are on your page, the people, the images of who are, who are on your page, um, that can be very important. Um, the resources that you post, the blogs that you post, that can all be telling to, you know, you being welcoming to this community. Um, and then going back to the intake process, I would say really I'm of the social like way. So don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it's, you know, these pay these forms are all things that we want to give for these the services we provide. So reach out to other therapists in your community and do some consultation. I know we all do supervision and then sometimes private practice can get lonely. Um, so do some connecting to other clinicians and get some feedback on your forms because it may be something that you have just haven't thought about um, before. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And it's uh, the discussion of the website stuff, I think, leads us really nicely into question two here. Uh, Taylor's asking, how can we best market ourselves to the community and show that we are an ally? Uh, and it seems like this is a question that, that we hear a lot from folks who are wanting to be supportive and affirming, also wanting to uh, communicate that in, in ways that are meaningful because it's one thing to say that you are affirming and it's another thing to sort of walk the talk. Um, so how can you, in in your marketing, in a way that needs to be sort of efficient in messaging, make clear that um, that it is something that is is meaningfully important to you and not just Oh, sure, of course, I, I treat members as a community. Um, and Justin, I'll, I'll start here with you and then uh, Mo and Casey. Well, going back to the website, I think that's the most important. I think now we're so virtual. So um, images on your website, also social media. I think that is using that as a platform. You get to talk directly to your potential clients and people who access your services. Um, so not only doing videos, doing um, written posts, um, but visually showing your allyship um, to that community can be so important um, because as I'm looking for referrals, I'm looking at those things too to see what is, has been posted, what is visually on there um, for me to see, for potential clients to see. So using those visual things are so important just to, to start the website and social media. That's yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really useful way of kind of showing allyship over time, showing support for the community over time, showing that this is, you know, again, something where it's it's meaningful and not just a statement on the website, but really a, a key component of the practice that, that you have. Um, Mo, what would you add here? Yeah, absolutely. I would say ditto. That's, I mean, amazing. I think those are amazing first steps. And uh, the thing I'd add to, I think in my practice, I try to keep, uh, this is a little separate from marketing, but I try to keep some type of sliding scale open, especially when I wasn't seeing uh, predominantly transgender or gender queer people. Um, but I wanted that population to, to know that I was committed to work with them. I offer a sliding scale because I was aware of uh, the challenges that people in that community face to getting to therapy. So that was one thing that I was marketing my accessibility. And I think that it shows allyship when you offer things like that. So I think that that's the one way I'd offer. Yeah, that makes sense. Casey? Yeah, I, I love all of these ideas. I think the queer community is um, conscientious, though, about rainbow capitalism, which is this idea of companies sort of capitalizing off of queerness, specifically right now in June and Pride Month, right? So if you do have an Instagram, make sure you're not just posting stuff about the LGBTQIA during June. Make sure that it's consistent throughout the year because guess what? Queer people have to be queer for the entire year, or rather they get to be queer for the entire year. So, so does your marketing. Um, I think one barrier people face in making this jump to marketing that they're affirming in a really explicit way is they worry about what clients they might detract or lose by being really explicit about this work. But I do think it's so important that you demonstrate your willingness to take that risk with our community and to not just, you know, I'm thinking about psychology today where you can check like, yes, I work with lesbians and bisexual people. Don't just check those boxes. Put the words in the actual text of your profile. That's what I look for when I'm referring out. And by doing so, I know that you've been willing to take the risk of maybe losing some homophobic clients in that process. That makes me trust you more with my people. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lindsay, who asks, how do you view the role or appropriateness of self-disclosure with LGBTQ plus clients regarding the client's own identity or experience? Um, Justin, I'll start again with you here. Well, I leave with my identity. Um, uh, I think it's just um, something I found that clients really appreciate and look for. Um, it makes my day when I get those emails. They're like, oh my God, I was looking for a gay black therapist and I found you. <laughs> so um, I think I lead with my identity. Um, 
And so I know, but finding that balance of self-disclosure with clients takes some time and practice. Um, luckily, I'm eight years in the game. So I think I found my balance um, of it. Um, but I know with people who are just getting into um, the counseling roles, it can be kind of nerve wracking of like how much self-disclosure do I do I give? And if I don't say it at the beginning, when do I say it? Am I not being honest with them? Um, so I think you have to find your balance in self-disclosure with that and what you're comfortable giving um, with your clients. But I think it can be so beneficial um, with your clients as well. So you're saying you've you've kind of found the balance that, that works well for you over time. Um, Casey, what about you? Yeah, I think that when it comes to sexual orientation, a willingness to disclose your identity is actually an act of social justice because people who are white, straight, and cis have a pretty easy job finding therapists that match those identities. And especially with sexual orientation, which is an invisible identity, oftentimes the only way to find that out is if a counselor is willing to be explicit about that identity. And I think depending on your theoretical orientation, you can really work with this disclosure in different ways because when a client is asking, are you gay, are you queer? What they're really asking is, can I trust you? Am I gonna have to teach you about me or do you already know some of the things that matter to me? And so when a client does ask this question, instead of out of maybe your own insecurity because you don't share an identity, instead of avoiding it, answering it and then making space for, okay, how did that answer feel? What, it, what was it that you were trying to understand about me by asking? And I think that even if your answer is, actually, no, I'm not in the community, I'm straight, it doesn't mean that that can't be a connective moment that builds rapport with a client. Yeah, it seems like the the idea of of leading with your identity, being transparent with your identity, um, that seems to be pretty common. Of course, with with some appropriate caveats around it in terms of, of safety and understanding. There's there are differences with different clients and that kind of thing. I'm curious, especially here about the experience part of this, because mm -hmm. I would imagine that each of you have had clients who asked at some point about your uh, relationship experience, your experiences with um, homophobia, discrimination, that kind of thing. Um, how do you feel about that sort of level of self-disclosure? Um, and Casey, I'll stay with you here for a second and then, then Mo, I'll go to you. Yeah, it depends. It definitely depends. So when I am working with a client in the community who doesn't have a lot of other community that identifies in a similar way, I am more likely to use myself in my experiences because I understand that there is a developmental value of being mirrored in terms of those experiences. But if there are many other LGBTQIA people in my client's life who I know are already doing a lot of that mirroring, I might hold back a little bit more and encourage the client to take up a little bit more space, but I'm certainly willing to disclose if I think that um, developmentally, it's going to be a positive mirroring experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on. I, I really believe that the work of therapy happens in the relationship with the therapist and the client. And so, uh, for a lot of queer people, I've realized uh, across the spectrum of identity and experience, community is so important. And when you're investing your time, energy, resources, uh, money in meeting with someone every single week, a lot of a lot of the time I notice uh, that what becomes important to people is that we're building uh we're building a, a relationship, but it's uh, it's a professional one, but they wanna know that I'm not a robot. Uh, and so sometimes, especially the further I get in my transition, sometimes I have to end up disclosing to people that I'm transgender. I've, I've certainly had people who read on my website that I, I am an expert in working with transgender identity. And the reason why they were coming to me was because they had a lot of uh, transphobia that they were working through. And so they didn't know oh, that I was transgender and I had to disclose that to them because they were fully in like a real transphobic moment. And I decided to disclose that then instead of waiting until we got further in the work. Uh, and then there would be like a harm that was created. So it was like, hey, I'm an expert because this is my lived experience. And so we're starting from a place of, okay, 
now you know this about me and you're working through transphobia. How do we, you know, do this work together? Sometimes I think that disclosure is important. Now, most of the time, the clients that come to us will be a part of the community and will be curious about our identities. And I think uh, from my experience, people are curious about my identity because they want to know for instance, people, they might ask, are you married? They want to know if love is possible for a transgender person. Uh, and so I love that Casey's talking about getting to those questions, uh, like what is behind the question? Because really it's something that's really of value to the client. And so I'm totally in agreement with that. Justin, I saw you nodding along. Was there anything you wanted to add here? I was just loving all the answers that they were giving. Um, so I think, um, especially me being a professor and people who are early on, it's really kind of shied away from a little bit from self-disclosure because being so new to counseling, but I think as you get more seasoned, you see the value in it and try to find, like I said, find that balance in it um, and getting a behind the question of like, you know, why is this important? Even you as a counselor getting some insight on why this might be important to them to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our next question comes from Mona, who's asking, are there any good uh, trainings or certifications that you would recommend for mental health therapists on the topic? Um, and this is this is for anyone, um, but I guess, uh, Casey, let's start with you and then Justin, then Mo. Well, I definitely want to re-uplift Mo's training because I can only imagine how beneficial that would be. Um, I myself offer a number of trainings on this topic. I actually have one coming up specifically on gender neutral language and using pronouns. Um, I'm really excited about that. For me personally, um, my ASECT certification as a sex therapist was really instrumental in helping me because I think many of the trainings on this topic actually miss the sex part of this topic. And so I guess my recommendation would be, um, it's great to have sort of the knowledge of what it's like to be out in the world as an LGBTQIA person, but also know what goes on behind the scenes, know what goes on in the bedroom for LGBTQIA people, it's just as important. I would add, um, I found the most like value I got from trainings are going to conferences. I miss conferences like in person, um, but also the value now, I think of being virtual, you can go to so many and attend so many sessions. Um, I found that they, you get a, a large variety of, of topics that you can get for like bang for your buck. So like, like the ACA, the national conferences, you get to hear from people from across the nation. Um, and then what I love about those presentations is usually they will have a lot of resources and research and things that you can dig into deeper um, that you can kind of learn from not only the presentation, but the materials to build a presentation. Um, so that's usually what I what I recommend to people. Um, so I know sometimes certifications like uh, full ones can be expensive and a lot to like a, a commitment of time. Uh, but to start out, just going to those conferences and those topics that, you know, you want to start building some competency in. Yeah, absolutely. No, what about you? Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, in every single city there, I'm hoping this day and age, that might not be true. I know it's true in Chicago and uh, places across California and things. Uh, but in every city, if you can find a LGBT center, like in Chicago, Central and Halstead, we've got Howard Brown in Chicago, you've got a number of places here in Atlanta, but I'm thinking wherever you are, if you can find a center, often there are training resources at those centers, um, or figure out what large practices that are devoted to doing this work, what they're doing, and uh, getting tapped into those communities, that's like a great way to stay up to date on trainings. Uh, and then of course, another shameless plug for my course, <laughs> uh, because I do get to cover a lot of what goes into uh, creating an affirming space and then writing uh, letters for transgender people in therapy. So if you're interested in learning more about that subject specifically, then definitely that's a great place to start. Um, but certainly getting plugged into communities that are already doing the work, that's a, that's an even, that's also a great tool too. Well, I can certainly say firsthand, you know, Mo, your course is fantastic. It's amazing. So I'll, um, I'll keep saying that as we go here too. Uh, question five, 
Are there obvious blind spots when it comes to biases in clinicians who are straight or not part of the community? Uh, things that a lot of clinicians miss when it comes to being uh, affirmative. Um, and why don't we why don't we start, Casey, with you, and then uh, Justin? Yeah. When I was thinking about this question, a quote that I heard recently came to mind, and the quote was. In order to know me, you must forget that I'm gay, but you must also never forget that I'm gay. And I think that really speaks to the line that we have to walk as affirming therapists, which is to always allow the client's identities to impact the types of questions we ask and how we respond and how we view their development, but to never silo our clients too much into those identities such that we make it too much about those identities and not actually about the thing that they walked into therapy with. Um, you know, I think that one thing people often say when they come and work with me is like, I don't actually want to work on my transness. I just want to be in a place where people aren't going to just constantly ask me about my transness, right? So I'm not assuming that just because somebody is queer, trans, non-binary, that that has anything to do with their presenting problem while simultaneously using their knowledge of those identities to help you conceptualize. That's a really important point. Justin, what would you add? Um, I recommend uh, using media to your advantage. That way you don't have to depend on your clients to educate you so much um, about these blind spots. So watching like movies and TV shows sometimes can really give you some like historical context um, about what the community has gone through, even around um, rights and privileges um struggles of coming out um, people think think of coming out as just a one-time thing it could be it could happen over and over and over um, so even a little, little stressors that you may not have thought of um, you can kind of see in visual form in film um, and then i also think it really helps sometimes with clients clients bring up media so much in session um, even like the show pose i was just talking about pose with finale with the client and they, they relate to it and then that brings up their own feelings and experiences um, so I think that activity for you can really help get you like some insight into the community um, and help you with those blind spots that you're like, oh, I didn't even think that was a, a thing um, that they had to deal with. When it comes to those kinds of media depictions, I would imagine there's there's a balance, right? Because on one hand, they can be tremendously informative. On the other hand, they're not always informative in a useful direction, right? So um, how how would you encourage folks to kind of balance that out or, or to uh, maybe watch with, um, and I'm not even sure what word to put to it, like a, a, a grain of skepticism, but also understanding that a lot of the, the media depictions really have a lot of validity to them. I'll say talk about it. So talk about it with your other counseling friends, talk about it with um, other people in the community and like what is extended, what is not representative of the community um, and what is right on the money and what's like, oh, this is correct. And like, no, a lot of people struggle with this. Um, but just, you know, like I, 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 I keep saying it, make friends. I think it's private, pri private practice people and clinicians, you gotta talk to people, have consultations. Um, and I think finding that balance of what you see in the media because not only are you seeing it, they're seeing it as well um, and what that could be doing for them. Yeah, very true. Mo, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I just think uh, if you don't share the same identity as your client, then likely you have a blind spot. Um, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just being you. We all have blind spots because we can't live every single identity underneath the sun. Um, and so it's just, I guess, being aware of those blind spots, uh, uh, owning them, even if you can't be always aware of and know it, what each one is, but just honoring that they exist and that the potential can happen so that when they do happen, then you respond in a thank you so much for showing me that kind of way that's very gracious and affirming and celebratory. Um, I think that that's my biggest piece of advice. You can't be aware of all of the blind spots, but when they are brought to your awareness, uh, and handling them with grace and, and gratitude for the person sharing that with you, that's the biggest thing for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I see I'm having a little camera issue here. I'll get that corrected while we're working on the, the next question. 
Uh, but the next question on the slides is, um, how do we best include or support parents of teen LGBTQ plus clients who are struggling with acceptance of their teenager's identity, uh, name, and pronouns? I, I just saw a thread about this in a social media group for therapists uh, this morning, um, where it was a, a real struggle for the clinician about kind of how to best do this. Um, Mo, how would you... How would you advise a, a clinician here? This is a great question. I've had parents with kids as young as four years old in session with me. So it's a question that certainly comes up a lot. And I would say we're going to be asking this question a lot over the next 10 years because we'll have more and more kids being more aware of who they are earlier. And so uh, I think the best support is that the seeing the child as an equal client that's the first starting place the client the child is likely the client they're either the identified patient usually when they come in the parent is like i want to help the, my child with their identity um, and so then we want to really get a lot of information from that child about who they know that they are and when that child says hey i know who i am or even i'm questioning who i am we want to hold like a really open space for them to build their narrative. We don't want to repeat any uh, any harms that we have often seen played out in our society where parents kind of tell kids who they are. Uh, while that child is figuring it out or if they come to you knowing who they are, we want the child to really be creating a, a narrative about themselves. So that's the first place that I start is asking uh, all of my uh, children to have individual sessions if possible so that I get a good sense of who they say they are when their parents aren't around. And then having the parents, depending on the age of the kid, so if they're really young, uh, they don't really get to keep a lot of information from their parents. Um, so the parents kind of need to know what the child is saying at all times. But as they get older, uh, having some type of separation between the child and the parent is still really important. So that that child knows that they can have like their own individual relationship with you and you'll kind of talk to the parents when it's necessary. And then if you're there for family therapy and everybody's in the room, uh, I think that's a pretty good time to do some work with the parents around their own uh, celebratory and affirming uh, way of being at home. So maybe the parents are struggling with pronouns. I want to get to the bottom of that, uh, because ultimately when they leave the, the, your office, they're going to meet other transgender people. I put it in the context of uh, if, what if this wasn't their kid? Uh, we'd be doing work around trying to figure out what's preventing them from being affirming and celebratory. Um, but in the context of their child, identity, name, pronouns, uh, I'd want them to put it in the, the context of, okay, what about when my child goes to school? Uh, will they need support? Will they need me to advocate for them? So I'm often working with them to be like, the world is going to be a little challenging for your kid. Can you be the part, the place that's a safe base? Can we shift the, the lens and the narrative a little bit? Uh, and then I'll say one little thing, too, about hormones and surgeries, because that does come up, especially when you have teenagers in some states. Teenagers with their parents' consent can um, get, uh, and this, I know this question isn't about, just about gender, but I'm speaking specifically to gender. Um, but when uh, in certain states, some uh, kids, depending on their age, can have hormones or surgery depending on their parents' consent. And so sometimes those conversations come up and I'd like to navigate them with a lot of care. So I, if you don't feel like you know a lot about that subject, I get very, very educated. Uh, I would get a lot of resources um, and try to navigate that that situation with the parents, not just from the parents kind of telling you what they want to do, more so like having it be an inclusive dialogue, uh, an affirming dialogue about those things. Uh, but I, I just answered the question around gender um, and I'll leave it open for anybody else. Yeah, Justin and Casey, I, I saw you nodding along there, and I would imagine that, you know, one of the things that, that you all see clinically is um, when a, an adolescent 
starts the coming out process and, and tells their parents about where they are. Um, parents have their own fears, hesitancies, biases, and how do you um, how do you include parents in that process um, in a way that that might recognize that they do have those uh, fears, biases, etc., um, but that also makes room for them to develop when it comes to those and, and maintain a good positive relationship with their kid. Um, Justin first and then Casey, I'll come to you. So I like what Mo said about like the parent being a safe face. Um, so even if a parent, you do have a lot of thoughts, a lot of feelings and fears, um, it's going to be important for that parent to have their own space with, with, with that therapist or a different therapist that they can process that stuff. Um, that way they can get it out and look at it, unpack it. Um, that way they can be in a space to be supportive to their teenager um, moving forward um, and just having some understanding to work with their teenager um, and not like basically having that word vomit with them and then having that regret of like, oh, I didn't mean that. I, I, I don't know why I even said that um, because they might've been in a place of fear um, and a kind of high emotion. Um, so I think it's important to support the parent and having them a safe space to process things um, separate from their child. That way they can be a safe space for the child when they're together. Yeah. Casey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think when we ask a parent to be a safe space around gender and sexuality, we're more often than not asking them to be um, the type of secure base that they never had themselves. And so that's the opportunity for us as if we're the parents therapist to be that secure base for them around gender and sexuality. And I think one of the first things that I do in this context is um, understand my client, the parents own journey around their sexuality and gender and different messages they received when they were very young because we know that without intervention, we're often just repeating what was taught to us. And so making space for any trauma around this or missed education that the parents themselves might have and being modeling that secure base and modeling what it's like to hold space for those conversations. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, our next question I think is uh, a bit of a softball here for Mo. Uh, Mo, what is the uh, best place to start? Where is the best place to start regarding letter writing for gender affirming surgeries? You're starting with my course, and uh, and if you're asking about the process in terms of uh, writing letters, I would always start with um, I would always start with exploring what requirements the you, the client's insurance panel. Uh, what requirements that panel has for that particular surgery uh, or if there's a medical procedure like hormone therapy in certain states, uh, certain states have different requirements. In Chicago, I didn't need any letters for hormones. In Georgia, I needed that. Um, and so it just really is a toss up. And so I'd say that you want to to start by exploring what your state laws are, what kinds of discrimination is happening in your state regarding uh, transgender people, uh, because all of that is impacting uh, the kind of care you're going to be able to provide. Uh, I want, if you are a Medicaid or Medicare provider, you want to know those kinds of laws. Uh, so I'd start with policy. Uh, I want to know if the human right, rights campaign or any other organizations that uh, help with transgender equality, uh, if they have any notices that they've put out recently that would be helpful. So I'd start with policy, I start with state laws, and then I get training on this particular subject just because you want to make sure that you're providing quality letters for clients uh, because in my personal experience and in my professional experience, I've seen uh, clients have letters returned. Uh, I've had letters returned and therapists have to write me other letters. Uh, and, and it's a long, long process. I mean, we're talking about people on wait lists for surgeries for uh, a year or two. And so we don't want a letter to be returned and then prolong that process even more. And so I'd start with training, 
but then to also know your state policies. There are states that don't have protections uh, in place to help transgender people to not be discriminated against. And so we want to know what we can do on our end to avoid any kind of discrimination that's already in place on the state level. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Sarah, who asks, how should intersectionality affect how we practice and work with our clients? Now, this is a, a big topic. It's one we could spend hours on um, by itself. So um, we can we can sort of talk briefly in, in broad terms here. Um, the, how should intersectionality uh, affect this kind of work? Uh, Justin, I'll start with you. Um, I would say that it just helps you see the person as a whole. Um, so having an understanding and insight around the many different identities that a person can be holding in the different spaces that they um, have to be in with these identities and what that means for them in the world and structure that they could be going through um, and trying to cope with. Um, so I think it helps you, gives you greater insight into your clients who have an understanding of the many different things that are, that are could be going on um, with them. Um, even going back to like your your intake forms. So those questions that you're talking about, though, that intake form can give you a lot of the possible intersectionality that's going on with your current client. So it really kind of ties back into the beginning. <laughs> I just wanted to add on to that. I think that often we think about the lesbian community being a really small community and the gay community being small, et cetera, et cetera. But within those communities, there are an infinite number of other communities. And I found that the experience of white lesbians is very different from the experience of many black lesbians. And knowing that the more marginalized identities too that are intersecting, like the more important it is to be conscientious about this because there's a reason why lesbians who are women um, still make a lot less money than gay people who are men. And so noting those, intersect, uh, those intersections and in the different experiences, especially when there are multiple um, marginalized identities is essential because the range of experiences is so wide. And then you add on um, socioeconomic status, geographical location, whether or not um, the person is experiencing a disability, and then there's just sort of an infinite number of combinations. So just being aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. Mo, did you want to add anything here? No, I think that they answered it perfectly. Yeah. All right, then our last question. Uh, Casey, I'll start with you here. This comes from Tracy, who asks, how can we support relationships, more specifically queer couples? Definitely. Well, I think one place to start is, you know, non-monogamy is not the same thing as queerness. However, people in the LGBTQIA community are more likely to be non-monogamous. So on intake forms and the assessments, instead of talking about couples or marriages, talking about partners and relationships, because that makes more space for there to be more than two people in a relationship. And it states really explicitly that marriage is not how we validate whether or not a relationship um, is real. And that's especially important in this community where we weren't allowed to get married until just a few years ago. Um, and then, as I was saying earlier, not shying away from researching and understanding LGBTQIA sex. It's different for every single one of those letters. I think oftentimes, even, even folks in the community who feel insecure about sex shy away from those questions. But if all of us, uh, especially if, if cis straight people didn't even get great sex ed, you better bet that queer and trans people got pretty much no sex education. And you might be the only person in their life and the only space they have to talk about that. So um, so do the work to sort of uh, notice, the different, notice the different biases and insecurities you have about that so that you really can regulate yourself in those sessions through those conversations. Oh, and also in terms of being trans affirming in those conversations, I, well, actually just affirming in general, expanding what your definition of sex is. It is not just penis vagina sex. It is not just penetrative sex. Um, it, sex can happen for some people without even touching. And that's really important to acknowledge. Also, knowing that the biological terms we're given for people's body parts aren't the only options we have. There are often more affirming ways that we can talk about people's bodies, especially for trans and gender expansive folks. So if you are going to be talking about a client's body, and I think this is true for any client, 
asking how they like to refer to that part of themselves rather than assuming that they like to use what we you know, traditionally refer to as anatomically correct parts. That's a great point. Thank you so much, Casey. Justin and Mo, I saw you both uh, nodding along. Justin, did you want to add anything? Just clapping for Casey. I love what she's saying and just holding that space for people. So, so many times I think counselors shy away from sex um, and exploring that area with clients. Um, so I really like just encouraging couple, I mean, client, uh, clinicians um, to do some work around that, to process their own stuff about being shying away from that topic with their clients so they can hold that space for their clients. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. No, anything to add? Yeah, just one quick thing. I think uh, encouraging everyone here to not, uh, I guess I want to say just to never underestimate uh, your clients. And, uh, and what I really mean by that is like, just because you see a, a couple or a triad or however many people in your office does not mean that they have, you know, uh, they're just like out and proud. So I guess never miss the conversation about their coming out process. I think I found a lot in therapy that coming out still really impacts people's relationships, uh, whether or not mom or dad or uh, sister is comfortable with my relationship can seep into my relationship. And so it's something that really still should be talked about. So don't assume just because you see people in this really loving partnership that they're not being impacted by the stuff that traditionally impacts queer people. Uh, and I think this happens a lot for non-monogamous folks, that people will forget that they're also dealing with these kinds of uh, structures that are oppressive um, and can really miss how those basic things like parents not agreeing with their their partnership um, can really impact their larger their their larger relationship identity. Yeah, that's a great point. I, um, I was recently working on a, a course on measurement tools for romantic relationships. And one of the things that's coming up in the more recent research there is this notion that um, social support is actually a, a pretty strong predictor of yeah. whether somebody's relationship is going to be satisfying and lasting. And there has been, I think, renewed attention to that as a variable, precisely for the reasons that you're talking about. That, you know, it's not just a, a question of, um, you know, whether family is approving, that's certainly part of it, but it also is a, is a question of outness. Um, and it's a question of the degree of oppression that you're going to experience as a result of being in the relationship. So um, thank you. That's a, it's a fantastic point. Um, and it's a good way to move us into uh, final thoughts here in just one second. Um, I want to mention again the course that you have, Mo, for Simple Practice Learning on Writing Clinical Letters of Referral for Gender Affirming Medical Care. It's fantastic course. I've been a, a licensed MFT for a long time. I learned a ton from that course. So I'm really grateful for it. Um, we also have up on Simple Practice Learning Gender Minority Stress in Trans and Non-Binary Clients. Um, Caden Cathers is based here in Southern California, fantastic trainer, uh, is involved with an organization called The Affirmative Couch that does a fair amount of, of good specific teaching and training on the topic. So Caden's fantastic and that, that course is certainly worthwhile as well. Um, wanted to give each of you a moment here for um, kind of final thoughts, anything that we didn't ask about you wanted to make sure to add um, or or any place that you would uh, draw folks' attention to before we call it a day here. Um, Casey, I'll start with you and then Mo and then Justin. I think I would just add that every single person, even if you are straight and cisgender, has a journey around this stuff. And so don't disqualify yourself as a therapist for deserving and needing um, a therapist in a space where you get to talk about and process this. I think that's probably the best thing that you can do for your clients in this community. Um, another thing I just wanted to mention is via my Instagram queer sex therapy, I post every single day about different ways that we can be more affirming to this community. That's sort of like a very simple five minute check in daily that you can do to just um, consistently increase your awareness around that community. So just wanted to offer that resource as well. And just one more time for anybody who uh, is writing it down. That's uh, Queer Sex Therapy on Instagram? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. 
Thank you, Casey. Mo? Awesome. I just want to say that if you are on the fence about your ability to work with this community or specifically the transgender community to uh, to not be on the fence anymore, go ahead and take a deep dive into the work. You're ready. Uh, what I think I've learned so much uh, during my journey, my personal transition, but also my work as a therapist with the community is that uh, we are all in transition every day. We're always evolving. We're always changing. We're always growing. And so you don't have to feel like you have to be a perfect mirror in order to sit with someone in transition. You can relate to uh, loss. So like loss of identity after uh, you lose a job or some other way you identify yourself and then having to rebuild. We can all relate to that. You can relate to just being a human with intersectional identities because you might be sitting with a transgender person who is not working on their transition. Uh, just feel ready today. Uh, and again, I'd like to um, I'd like to add if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, I'm on Instagram at love out proud. And I also share a lot about my personal journey, but also my work with transgender people there. So follow me on Instagram at love out proud. Love out proud. Thank you very much, Mo. Uh, Justin. I want to like share um, being like grateful for everybody attending today um showing like interest in this community because our community the community i'm a part of we need therapists we need um the support research all, you know, already shows a higher distress level um with our community um so you know you have that clinical training as we keep you know competency is a journey it's always evolving um and thankfully i feel like information is so accessible at this time uh, whether it be simple practice or conferences or different webinars. Um, so, you know, taking that time to get that information um, to really show up and be present for this community that really needs the support. Um, and then everybody can follow me on Justin Smith Counseling on Instagram. Um, I like to be social. So any questions or consultations, I'm open to um, that type of work as well. Excellent. Thank you. And, and once again, that's Justin Smith Counseling on Instagram. Um, thank each of you so much. Really, really appreciate your time, your expertise, um, all of your contributions here today. Uh, for those folks who are in attendance, please know that we have been recording this as well. So you get an email that's got uh, some links and things as well as a, a recording of this webinar. Uh, it usually comes out within a, about a day of our webinar being concluded. Uh, once again, I'm Ben Caldwell. On behalf of all of us at Simple Practice, Thank you so much for the fantastic work that you do. We'll see you again soon. Take care.